I think saying emerging is a little bit wrong, but they are the future of our generations. So I pay my respects to them. Now, housing is a big issue in Australia because housing to me is a personal thing. Housing is something that is my inherited right. Housing is something that has never been discussed properly because housing has always been used to portray the bad people, you know, the ones that can't survive, which is a lie. The problem is we could handle the Aboriginal housing overnight if my inheritance and every other Aboriginal person's inheritance was followed. And if, like every other act we've ever introduced, we started the first legal services, you got them because we did. We started the first health services, we and you got them because we did. We started law changes to the child, safety and child protection, you got the same changes because of us. And I'm saying that the real problem is not about um, housing so much as what the government does. We have a few, as far as I heard, the figure was somewhere around 100,000 to 200,000 empty houses that belong to overseas investors. Now, I'm not saying they shouldn't, but I'm saying if they're not living here, then tax them a bit more and put that into a community housing fund. You know, you're still paying rates. You're still paying, um, if you own a property, you're still paying land tax. Well, just up, just up the land tax on all the overseas investments so that it matches the need for housing in this country and you would solve the problem. But every government is scared to take that risk. The other thing that's very important to note about housing is I should have three houses in my country. Frankie there should have three houses in his country because the Marbo case proved our right to our inheritance. And yet what they did was called it heritage. So they wiped out the last 250 years of our inheritance as Aboriginal people. Understand me well, I am saying the Heritage Acts and the Housing Acts need to change but we need to change the most important. Did you know there is no protection for any of Australia's last 250 years of iconic arts? No protection for Banjo Patterson, no protection for Henry Lawson, no protection for Mae Gibbs, no protection for the Heidelberg School of Art, different from the Heidi School of Art too, by the way. Um, what that means is anyone can use Australian iconography if they want to pay for it. Anyone. One of the things I've been pointing out for the last few years, which nobody seems to notice, except that thank goodness for Leah Purcell, is that every painting of the poem, The Drover's Wife, only shows the back of her. Why? Because white people didn't want to paint Aboriginal people in them days, accept them as what they were. The drover's wife. When they wrote about the man from Snowy River, for a couple of years I have been going on about, as has a, 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 a Mara fella named Malta Saunders, on the evidence is there that the man from Snowy River was Aboriginal. 
He was just a lad. That's what the white fellas used to call small Aboriginal people if they didn't want to describe them as being Aboriginal. And the horse that was used came from that way. And there's proof that um, the bloke that wrote uh, The Man from Snowy River stayed up in the Snowy River. So your iconography is also part of my iconography that has not been recognised. It's only when you examine Australia carefully, you notice these things. You notice that uh, the Victorian Heritage Act, like the Australian Heritage Act, only covers old squatters' trees, old boats and old buildings. Nothing to do with what we call the Australian culture. We were part of the Australian culture. Man Grook. Um, if you examined every country where the British settled, Australia is the only one that keeps trying to cling to this laid back Aussie way, which was really the Aboriginal way. We didn't panic. We just said, okay, did we ever do that in our history uh, of 60 to 100,000 years? Did something like that ever happen? We had those stories recorded so that we would remember those things. They are now part of our so-called forgotten heritage. The Aboriginal Heritage Act needs changing, but it won't be changed until you, the non-Aboriginal people, examine your heritage. And uh, there's a reason I'm doing this, and I'm going to reveal it now. If I can change your Heritage Act, we as Aboriginal people can then change our Heritage Act to include the last 250 years. Lastly, we can create a case for inheritance rights. But we're going to need you first. And by the way, if I get my inheritance right, if I get it, there's my 50 acres. I'll divide it into three areas. Tell you why. I'm from a mob that went from the mountain range to the grass plains into my area and to the um, box ironbark forests in my area. So I should have three houses to accommodate those three areas. I'll give two of them to my children. So at least I've got a permanent home and then they can have uh, the other two. But the thing is, I need you to change your Heritage Act so that I and a few others can push to change our Heritage Act. And then if we get into discussion on inheritance, well, then if we get our inheritance, we won't be bothering white Australia with a housing deal. And so all the money that's wasted on housing would only go to supporting the rest of Victoria's housing needs. So it's a threefold strategy. It won't all work at once, but there's an election coming up in November between the 20th and my birthday. So I want a birthday present that we get the Heritage Act changed, please. Because there's as I said, it is about housing, but in a backward way. If we Aboriginal people had our inheritance, we wouldn't need to fight for our housing. And that would free up more housing for non-Aboriginal people. If we recognise and push together that private owned overseas housing, flats, whatever you want to call them, is, has an extra percentage put onto its uh, land tax because they're not bloody using it, then that money also can go into housing to help create more public housing. We're looking at on a way that they always say, oh no, every subject is separate. That's a bloody lie. 
every subject is interconnected. And the only way is to stop looking at them as individual pieces of legislation because they're used to trick you. They don't show the connection between health and housing. They don't say the connection between education and housing. They don't talk about the connection between emotional and mental well-being and housing. They are, according to them, separate subjects where in actuality they are one. Handle the housing problems and you will gradually improve health. Handle the housing problems and you will gradually increase um, education. So all this crap they tell you that, oh, it's a separate thing, is a lie. And it's the way governments have fooled you for years. Every time some new subject comes up, they then separate it out from what it's related to. So you think you've done a good thing when you've only done half the battle. They trick you. They lie to you. You know why the real reason the government lies to you? Because it doesn't want to admit how many billions Victoria is broke by. Myself, Harry there, quite a few others of us that were stolen generations, they're going to give us 100,000 for fucking years of pain. I have had two fucked shoulders for over 15 years. I've got scarring on all my shoulder muscles. And yet I get 100,000 as compensation. Thank you. When we started Stolen Gents, the non-Aboriginal that were in orphanages complained. Guess what? They got three times what we did. Back when 300,000 could buy a house. What do we get? 100,000. We fought it, we raised it, and what I get is just more pain because I have to prove I'm Aboriginal and I have to look at my records so that I could say to them, this is when this problem started. Why can't I get money to fix it? I have to go live through my pain, my anger, and sometimes my emotional well-being just for a lousy $100,000. Hell, I'd rather spend me $10 each week in tax lotto and hope one day that gives me a million dollars. But, and then I'll be able to buy my girls a house. But what I'm getting at is I'm not looking to be a beggar. None of us are that have been homeless. None of us are that have to struggle every day to find somewhere to live, somewhere safe. None of us should have to go through that. But we do, both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal. This is not a problem that's just Aboriginal. This is a problem for all Victoria living people. The real problem, we have to reclaim our inheritance. And the only way I can do that is get you to examine your Cultural Heritage Act and you will see that there is no protection for iconic art, there is no protection for iconic artists, there is no protection for our cultural ahem, inheritance from all the past artists and people that helped make this country. The most beautiful song I've heard that talked about what I'm talking about is the native born by a gentleman that just passed away recently after he wrote. Because Albert Namajira painted what he saw. It was the first mixture of Aboriginal uh, love of their country and wanting to explain their country done using the European style. 
Why it isn't considered iconic Australian art, I don't know. Because that's the first example of us crossing in art. I won't go into again the man from Snowy River and uh, my two favourite subjects, the um, uh, the drover's wife and the man from Snowy River, because I am saying to you, if we fix up all the heritage acts, then we'll handle our inheritance. If you can help us fix up the acts, we can handle our inheritance and take the Aboriginal housing out of the equation, leaving more money where we'll support you on getting some standard, not substandard, but above standard housing for the rest of the homeless in Victoria. I know it sounds convoluted, I know it sounds like a long shot, but I've um, spent four years looking at these things. I've spent 35 years on advisory committees for the museum in Victoria on, by the way, culture and heritage. Um, and I was one of the first rebels under the original cultural heritage agreement. So whilst I haven't been working in any official capacity in them, I've always kept up to date with any act where I work and any way I can find a way of getting something about. I want, in the next election, for you to get your cultural heritage act fixed. And that allows for, for us to aim at our inheritance as was stated in the Marbo case. So that means that I can go walk into the bloody bush and where it's government land and there's a house on it, I can go, especially if it's in my area. Okay, I've got my inheritance now. I can do that if I can get the Heritage Act changed. If I can get the non-Aboriginal Act changed, I can then get the Aboriginal Act changed. Because every law I've ever got done, which includes this Criminal Expense Act, it was because a lot of non-Aboriginal people were also supporting that change to get a Criminal Expense Act. When we won other battles, it was because the non-Aboriginal people joined us in changing things. I am not going to speak about the um, voice in Parliament until I actually see what's written. Because you see, does it mean that they recognise our sovereignty or not? Is the first question. Second, is it only an advisory voice or has it got a real voice to help make decisions on real policy and real changes? It didn't work with ATSIC. It didn't work with the Australia uh, Aboriginal Commission. It didn't work because they were more symbolic than they were actualities. And I'm scared this is another symbol. I'd rather see the housing problems of Australia fixed up first before I discuss treaty. I'd rather see our health needs fixed up first before I start discussing treaty. And um, luckily for me, Lydia Thorpe, in her own way, has been talking about that with the Greens and with uh, uh, the parliament itself saying, well, no more symbology. It's time you did something rather than talk about it. It's time to move away from symbology to actually doing something. And the housing is the same thing. Symbol, symbology. Oh, we, we housed a 1,000 people this year. Yeah, while well, you left another 20,000 out in the dirt. Symbology means nothing. It's a way of fooling you to make you feel good and to make them get away with it without doing any bloody thing. 
And it's the same. They'll talk about the housing prices till they, well, until we're all dead. Um, and they will. They'll talk about it, but they won't change it. Why? Because they'll use some other excuse. We haven't got the budget. Oh, wait on. Isn't this a health problem as well as a housing problem? Why can't you combine the two to bloody do something? Oh, no, they're separate issues. No, they're not. They're the same bloody issue. Healthier people, housed people, better educated kids because they've got good housing, better standard of living because they've got good housing, maybe better foods because they've got good housing. I want that for my kids like you want it for your kids or yourselves, depending on your age. If you're young enough, yeah, and if you win tax lotto, you may be lucky. But unless we force the state government to stop coming up with big wanky ideas like building mini suburbs with no infrastructure, um, look, forget that. House the people that already need housing. Build the infrastructure that's already needed. You know, for Fitzroy, for 10 years, they had an empty Fitzroy High School. For 10 years. The minute I wanted to squat it, they decided to turn it back into a school. <laughs> and a basketball centre. Um, so I'm telling you, there are the places, there are the facilities, there are the structures that are not being used. And this is where we're being lied to. If you want to lower the housing costs, tax the rich. If you want to lower the housing costs, tax the overseas investors. And you'll soon get enough to fix the housing problem. Especially as here, you know. Um, uh, what the hell? I don't even think 100,000 will afford, afford me a deposit on the house. Or if it does, then my girls are going to be paying it off for the rest of their lives. So I'm trying to push that I want um, 50,000 a year increase on that 100,000 for the next four years. Because guess what? That takes it up to exactly $1 million at the end of four years. And if the housing price, price keeps dropping, maybe I won't wait for my inheritance. I might be able to in four years time afford a couple of houses if the prices drop enough. And I don't want them in Melbourne, I want them in my area because I want my children knowing their area and I want their children knowing their area and I want their children knowing their area. The other day, or no, actually two months ago, on an idea I was talking about ten years, uh, five years ago with my daughters, my daughter wrote a submission to uh, a thing called uh, Urimboy, which is the Aboriginal Festival next uh, May, where we thought about the idea, what stories from the old stories would we like to pass on because we can demonstrate they have meaning today, and what stories would we like to create for 50 years in the future with what we think should be passed on for them from 50 years from now. Trouble is all of you, you've all been taught to think in three year gaps because the government has said, we are elected every three years, so you have to vote for us and we'll tell you what we think we'll do. I'm glad the teals came along. Um, I'm glad the Greens are now a major party. Well, they're bigger than the bloody uh, nationals anyway in numbers. So I'm glad of that because it means change will gradually happen in the federal parliament. But we need to find out who the Teals are that are going to stand against the Liberals as they are and who the ones going to stand against Labor because they're the ones to talk to about what policy changes are needed. Because Labor will listen and then give you a watered down version. Liberals will listen 
And if it doesn't suit them, they won't do it. So you have to now, because the minor parties are going to be the most influential, you now have to convince the minor parties, if they want to call them minor parties, the Greens, um, the Teals, and any Labor left that's fighting its own, and I do mean this, I'm sick and tired, and I've been going on about this for years, parachuted politicians. I want local politicians because local politicians know actually what their area is about. They actually know what their area's main concerns are. Whereas when we've got uh, uh, backroom boys in both Liberal and Labor making the decisions, we are not getting proper representation because they're being told by the executive what their policy will be, not what their community wants, which is why there's been so much revolt in both New South Wales Labor and hopefully in Victoria Labor and uh, the federal parliament. We need to keep it going until governments turn around and start going, and especially the back room boys and girls go, okay, what is your real problem? Talk to us. We need to force them. And you know what forces them out the most? When they get the election. And if it happens for too long, like Albanese, they had to change their policy and use some popular ones that the people for those areas wanted. I'm sorry this sounds like a political rally, but the truth is, if we want to fix housing, we have got to go to all the teals and all the labour that are dissatisfied with labour and say, you need to hear what we have to say. Form your policy based on that. I just got some um, legal, political advice on something I've been working on for four years. And uh, I'm waiting for the now legal, legal advice. Um, and I don't want to go into too much details, but I'm telling you part of the strategy now involves you looking at your heritage act so that if you can get your Heritage Act fixed, we'll get our Heritage Act fixed, and then we'll start on the subject of inheritance. And if we get our land, trust me, there'll be more, we'll support taxing the um, overseas investors. We'll support the idea that there should be more housing for the Australian public that lives in Victoria, because we've been through the same things. It's not an us first them. It's how do we bloody work together to make sure we get the changes we need to make sure everyone has the right to housing. I thank you for putting up with my um, boring speech, but the idea I do understand is that some laws need to be changed and some act of parliament need to be changed for housing to get successful. And if we can take our percentage of the Aboriginal population that are homeless out of the figures, it will help use on when they say, oh, wait on, now that they've got theirs, we're going to cut the budget. No, we'll fight with you to make sure the budget is increased. Because if for us to succeed, you also have to succeed. And um, the important key of it is they're saying there is no heritage after the last 250 years. Well, I would argue that's used to stop me from getting my inheritance. I would argue it's a very sneaky, underhanded technique to stop me from getting my inheritance. And I would argue if you change that one law, one act, 
I and a lot of other Aboriginal people will then be able to present our case for our inheritance But um, the unfortunate thing is, if they also did that, I would get that million dollars. Right? It wouldn't be 50,000 a year then, but I'm trying to add to the uh, 100,000. It would be straight out acceptance. But yeah, 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 okay. We own, we the government claim we own this land. Which land of yours do you want back? That's all I want. You? I'll fight for you to get your house. Fight for you to get your housing rights. I will fight for anyone to get their housing rights because, trust me, when I grew up, I was just a boy in the street. I know homelessness, but I don't talk about it much. I know violence, but I don't talk about it much. I know a lot of things, but I don't talk about it much. Why? because they're my personal story. And every one of us has a similar personal story when you talk about being a stolen gent. Even though our pains are different because of what happened to us and how it happened, we all still have pain. And we all are being doled out on our inheritance. They may see their children do that. This is what you get in jail. Those who, and by the way, I think I said this last week, um, for those of us approaching 70s and in our 70s and in our 80s, we may not live to see our children howled unless we act together. Start with mom and dad for our housing rights. Don't give them housing Not rights. Inheritance. It has rights. Every one of you who's got a parent who, when they die, will inherit their house will understand what I mean. Anyone who's getting really old and got, got some money or some valuables that they want to pass on to the children will understand what I mean. And sometimes it's an old family diary. Sometimes it's an old Bible in some cases. You know, you can think go up the hill and find people that have kept a diary since uh, a Bible since everyone's birth since the 1800s. So there is the stuff out there. We'll fight for that. But first, we have to get the help that we need change what we need to change and then we'll be no longer oh those Aboriginal what about their housing problem no get me the change in the Heritage Act and I'll start talking about the Mabo Act and its meaning of their inheritance when you deny the last 250 years of my existence you are cutting off my Inheritance, not my heritage. Inheritance, not my heritage. The inheritance that we talk about that was passed from the creators to our ancestors who passed it along the generations. That didn't end 250 years ago. It still hasn't ended. Help me fix my housing problems and you help yourself fix your housing problems. As I said, I'll fight with you to push for um, overseas investment, getting extra tax to help raise the funding for housing. I'll argue if all of us get our own homes that used to deserve housing and homes. Because what is a house? The way they say house, it's also a word that beats you. Housing can be any structure. A home is a different word and it has more meaning if everyone went out and every time someone talked about housing and instead of talking about housing go well where's my bloody home 
but has a different context. So here's a fellow that only went to, well, got kicked out the first time, but he quit the same time. I did kick him out at some point. I was up in the very dark. They told me that I was a savage and a bloody shit. So I argued with him. And uh, uh, long story short, he went and tried to uh, get the school to turn badly. And I walked into the school and said, you coming into the thing? I said, no, nah, I've already quit. And kept walking. I only went to resign from the school. What I'm getting at and I'm going too long is I need your help to change your heritage act so that I can change, or a lot of us can change our heritage act to start to talk about our inheritance. And I think for a bloke that used to just do crossword puzzles every day until he could learn English properly from onwards, I really do understand that when I say heritage first. Heritage says something has died out. Inheritance cannot be died out unless no one in your family is still alive. So I have daughters. I want them to get their inheritance. I'm sure every Aboriginal wants their children to get their heritage. And that's all I'm going to say about why I need your support change the Heritage Act so that we can change our housing situation. Thank you. Thank you, Uncle Larry. I'm just going to give everyone a second to deal with the rain. I don't know what's happening, but yeah. Yeah, some people can come inside. There's still a few spaces. There's like one, two, three, four, five, six. There's 10. There's actually 10 spaces inside. If anyone wants to come inside, I'll just give people a moment to rearrange themselves. Also, there's TVs in all of the rooms streaming the event. So if you want to sit in any of the rooms to watch the TVs, if you prefer that, All right, has everyone found a good comfy spot out of the rain? Some people are being rebels. <laughs> All right, thank you everyone. Thank you, Uncle Larry. Where's Uncle Larry? I'm not sure, there you are. Thank you, Uncle. I love listening to you speak. Um, welcome to Peer Stories of Homelessness in Nam. This is a double event co-launching the Bendigo Street documentary, the short version of the Bendigo Street documentary, and the three-part podcast documentary series, Homeless in Hotels. I'm sure that you've gone around and had a little listen to the podcast and had a look at the gallery and kind of have probably drawn threads together for what these two projects share. But I wanted to just say a few words about why we decided to have this event together. So myself, Jasmine, and Kelly and Spike, not sure where they are, but Kelly and Spike who made the podcast series. We wanted to have an event 
obviously the issues are very aligned. Um, so we were all involved in the Bendigo Street campaign in 2016, where we squatted up to 15 government owned houses that were acquired for the East West Link. And yeah, we made a demand basically for those houses to be turned into public housing. At that time in 2016, I think there was about 35,000 people on the public housing waiting list. And today there's about, I think over 100,000. So the issue has gotten worse as we all predicted, but that basically just shows that the issue is still very relevant. It's a big problem, as Uncle Larry said, you know, centering First Nations experience and their needs for housing will get us all housing. And the Bendigo Street campaign also really highlighted that. Anyway, so me, Spike and Kelly wanted to have this event together as well because we wanted to inspire peer produced projects. So, you know, their project is produced by themselves and they've, had experiences of homelessness and as well AOD. And I've also um, experienced homelessness and also was involved in the Bendigo Street campaign. And I think the really cool thing, there's a lot of cool things to be said about why peer produced things need to be more on people's radars and more people need to get involved in making things like that. But I think the main thing for me is that it challenges the way that knowledge has been taught to us the way that we've been told to have knowledge about other things, which is a very colonial way of uh, producing knowledge, doing research, doing journalism, which is always examining the other, you know, looking to other people. And so I think the really cool thing, and I think that brings the Institute of Postcolonial Studies into it as well, which is making peer produce things, it's challenging that. So I really encourage everyone to yeah, support peer produced things and do your own peer produced stuff. Anyway, so for the rest of the day, what's going to quickly happen is we're going to have a couple of speeches, quick little talks, and then we'll watch the film at 4.10, the short version of the documentary. And that will go on for about 20 minutes. And it'll be played here. It'll also be played in all of the different rooms. So feel free to walk through the rooms while watching it or just sit here. And after that, we'll have a panel discussion with the people who made podcast and the film and as well people who will be talking about their lived experience so I really appreciate you all coming I'm going to hand it over now to Carlo and he'll say a few words and then after that Miranda as well from the Brittle Foundation oh <laughs> hello <laughs> all right thank you thank you Jess Hi, everybody. I'll just be, I'll be very brief. I just wanted to step up here um, in the name of IPCS and just say a couple of, um, a couple of words. Um, first of all, of course, you know, to acknowledge um, that, you know, we stand on unceded land. And I wanted to say that IPCS sees itself as a project um, that is um, in solidarity with First Nations struggles here in, you know, across Australia, but also, also overseas. And that's kind of what also the post-colonial refers to. And this kind of ongoing concern with the lives of colonialism in Australia and overseas. Both the Bendigo Street and Homeless in Hotels um, projects are powerful creative projects depicting the lives of those affected by the ongoing housing crisis, a crisis which we're also asked to understand now is intimately linked to dispossession and the colonial logics of property. And over the last two years, um, Jasmine has been a visiting fellow at IPCS, which is why you're all, you're all here as well. Um, and we've learned not, not only about the action of Bendigo Street itself, but um, we've also learned more about um, what took place in, you know, in, those, in those months in Collingwood and in the, uh, the larger aims of the film project. And with its careful work, um, it's many collaborations um, all put together and seeking to show the way in which a politics around dwelling justice emerges from the experience of those affected by homelessness and dispossession. The point that Jazz was um, emphasizing just before and um, she passed on the microphone. I am of course thrilled that IPCS can be the space um, to present these sorts of projects, to talk about these sorts of things 
and, um, and to imagine what might be done on the basis of this work. Um, and just quick, one quick point about um, IPCS itself. So as, as some of you might know, we are uh, an independent project. So we are unaffiliated to the universities. We are a membership-based project. So um, this is a quick little invite for you to sort of, you know, um, log on to the website and look at membership and join us um, in this project, right, which seeks to transform our society. And um, I'll pass on the mic to, to Miranda. I was going to say a few words in support of the project um, Homelessness in Hotels. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak. So my name's Miranda and I'm uh, on the committee of the Regina Brindle Foundation. So I wanna talk a little bit about that. So we award annual grants of up to $5,000 uh, to projects that are driven by people who have used or are using alcohol and other drug and mental health services. So the, what we wanna see are projects that aim to promote consumer and, and peer voice. And uh, the Homelessness in Hotels project was one of the very deserving recipients of it. Um, so it's very nice to come here and, and see it in fruition. Um, so Regina Brindle was actually uh, my mother and she passed away at the end of 2018. So the foundation was started in her honor. Uh, she was a single mum and during the 90s she had a uh, had dealt with addiction and mental health issues and because of the fact that she was a single mum there was very little assistance she could receive. Um, a lot of the support that she wanted, the services she wanted to use wouldn't let her bring me along. Um, so really her only sort of choice was going to NA, which was great because I could, you know, sort of sit in a corner and pretend I was, wasn't listening to people's stories, but I was. Um, but that wasn't sort of the ideal support that she wanted. So years later, she'd start working in the alcohol and other drug sector and uh, coordinate peer-based projects. And I guess the idea for her was that peers should always have a seat at the decision-making table. Um, and yeah, she was, uh, she did quite a lot in that area. So we started up the foundation once she passed away. And uh, I guess our imperative is that money be given directly to consumers and to peers, not to organizations. So if we do get an application from an organization, um, it will immediately not be eligible. So um, applications usually open in December. So if you are someone who has used uh, alcohol and other drug or mental health services or is using them, um, I would encourage you to check it out if you have a project in mind that you think would be eligible. Thank you. Thanks, Miranda. Thank you. I'm not sure if anyone can spot Uncle Robbie anywhere, but if you do spot him, send him this way because he was supposed to be here, but I think he might have, um, yeah. Is he here? No, not here. Okay, I don't know. Someone's waving. Is he? No. Okay, I'm imagining things. Never mind. Okay, so yeah, Uncle Robbie was supposed to be here, but that's all right. I'll just do what I was going to do. I just wanted to introduce the film quickly to everyone before we play it. Um, yeah, so this film right now, it's 20 minutes. I'm hoping to get it to a feature length film. So the fundraisers going at the moment for that. And yeah, like a lot can be said about the film and what happened and all that, but you'll see that. And I guess I just wanted to give a little bit of like a personal reflection or um, yeah, give you a little bit of the reason why I wanted to make this film, which is basically like Bendigo Street changed a lot of our lives. Um, you know, like I was, and not just Bendigo Street, but you know, getting, getting the skills to learn how to squat you know, which a lot of us learned through Bendigo Street and became proficient at. Um, you know, like when I was 15, I was forced to leave home because of whatever. And I was living in a homeless refuge. And my social worker at the time, you know, she sat me down and she was like, okay, you have two options. One is you can apply for public housing. And she was like, you probably wait 10 years for it. And I remember she literally pointed to her desk and she was like, this is the paperwork. She had like a 
stacks of paperwork. She's like, you could do that, or you could be accepted into the social housing program where you have subsidized rent for a year, so you get cheap rent. And then after that, you're off to fend for yourself. And I was 15, right? So the fact that a 15 year old only gets these two options is pretty insane. I mean, it's not really an option, right? And so I went on to live in social housing for about a year, which was cheap rent. And then after that, I was off to fend for myself. And obviously, you know, being a young student, trying to get good marks and take your grades seriously at university was pretty difficult. So eventually I met a bunch of feral anarchists <laughs> at the anarchist book fair, actually, who were like, I think I went to a squatting workshop. Yeah, that's what happened. And then I met some of them and they were like, oh, you know, come to our dumpster diving party. I was like, what's a dumpster diving party? And they were like, oh, we have all this leftover food from the dumpsters and we're going to like cook it up and yeah, hang out and stuff. So that's how I got involved in squatting. And to be honest, up until that point, squatting was the most security I'd ever had in housing, you know, even with family. Uh, growing up, you know, we were renting. So we were like moving from house to house constantly whenever the rent was raised to find another place that was cheaper. So squatting really gave me security because it was being in a community, you know, it wasn't like going to work to get money. It wasn't dependent on always having enough money to be able to pay the completely unaffordable prices for rent that we have in this land. And so it, it really means a lot to me, you know, it really means a lot to me. And then when Bendigo Street happened, that even meant more because it wasn't just squatting so that you could live, you know, it was squatting with a political purpose. It was squatting to make a point. Uh, and that was really, really cool. And I think, you know, a lot of these things that happen with activist history, they get lost and people don't remember them. And I think that's really sad. Um, I think a lot of us, you know, we think back on certain campaigns and because we were so involved, we often have really negative things to say about it. Um, and I think that's, yeah, that's really unfortunate because one thing that I learned through making this film was that there were so many ways that the Bendigo Street campaign made a really big impact on people's lives, even on an individual level, that have been completely forgotten and don't get appreciated. And so, yeah, I'd really like to appreciate that and remember that and inspire further actions like that into the future. And for the feature length, if we do fundraise the money that uh, I need to have to be able to make it look nice and hear nice, uh, if we do, then we'll be able to include a really awesome interview with Uncle Larry that was done for the feature length. But unfortunately, I didn't, I wasn't able to include it in the 20 minute version. But that's, yeah, the next step moving forward. Really cool interview that we did with Izzy Brown as well and Megan Fitzgerald. And it would continue on with the story. I hope you really enjoy the film. And I really appreciate your coming. It's also going to be filmed on the big screen, I mean, screened on the big screen at the, dwelling just, the Forum for Del Dwelling Justice on the 26th of August at the Capitol Theater. So if you wanna see it on the big screen, you can come and see that. Um, and yeah, one last thing is I just really wanted to thank everyone who was involved in the campaign and who supported the campaign and who is in the film. I really wanted to say thank you to you all. And one last thing before we start the film, one last thing, sorry, is so a lot of you would know that Auntie Tanya Day was a person who was actually living with me on, yeah, six, 18 Bendigo Street for a while with us. And she was part of the campaign. She was a staunch activist. She was a really rad person to have around. Um, and she was, yeah. As you all know, she was murdered by police, and so we just want to have a mo we just wanted to have a moment of silence before the film begins, um, in respect of her and her memory, and then the film will begin. So we'll just start one minute of silence. <laughs> 